Good morning, um, attendees, to this ADI webinar. Um, it's a delight to see that hundreds and hundreds on, of you are on the line today. Um, it is always quite daunting to try and manage such a large audience, but we will try to give it our best shots. We have a fantastic array of speakers today from five continents ready to give you their insights on what has been an unprecedented situation in our times. All of you, we know, are trying your best to stay safe, but also you're trying your best to make life for people living with dementia and for their families and carers better. And this is a tough time to do that, as our constituency has been so much hit during this specific crisis triggered by the pandemic. We have tried our utmost best at ADI to provide each other with support. And we've been doing this now for over a month. We have already run four of these webinars for our members. And we've decided collectively that as we have all drawn so much comfort from this webinar and from hearing that we are not alone and from hearing some frankly brilliant ideas that have been coming, positive ideas from all over the world about what to do at this time, uh, we would very much like to share it with a wider audience. And this is why we have opened this specific webinar. We will probably open another webinar in a few weeks time on another topic that is becoming increasingly important. So keep on the line and follow us so that we will be able to share with you which one that will be. Um, now, um, I will start this webinar by uh, not introducing my fellow panelists, which I have to thank from the bottom of my heart because they responded so quickly and produced a slide at the speed of sound. But in order to make sure that we can uh, progress quite quickly with the, um, with the discussion, I'm going to start calling on my co-host for today, which is Kate Swaffer. So if I can have the next slide, please, Annie. So here are your co-hosts, myself, Paola Berberino, the Chief Executive of Alzheimer's Disease International, and Case Waffa, who is the Chair, CEO, and co-founder of Dementia Alliance International, as well as a board member of Alzheimer's Disease International. So Kate, please. Thank you, Paola, and thank you everyone for attending today. What an amazing, uh, amazingly large group of um, people. Um, so just a little bit about the COVID pandemic. It's challenging us all with an unprecedented threat and one that, sh but one that shows our interconnectedness. And uh, I think our strongest tools to respond are our solidarity and our cooperation. And these ADI webinars have been a fantastic example of that. Um, but in many ways, people without dementia are not used to the enforced isolation or social and physical distancing, whereas many people with dementia have been experiencing that from the day one of their diagnosis. In fact, through DAI, we've had some people report that their experience of living with dementia since COVID-19 has improved, and that's in part because their local and national organisations are now also providing online services and support which most of you will know, DAI has been doing that for almost seven years. So for DAI members, um, operating at an, in an online environment is almost our only place to operate. Um, I think though for many active advocates, for example, members of dementia working groups, um, many of us are finding that we're feeling a bit more bored and perhaps more isolated than we're used to. Um, and struggling with the loss of advocacy work and socialising in our regular routines. But I think for the vast majority of people with dementia, their usual experience is really one of isolation and of distancing, both socially and physically. Um, but there are many other stresses to think about for people with dementia and also their families who care from, for them, a lack of exercise, loss of routines, negatively impacting everyone's health, um, uh, physical and mental. Um, and then uh, many advocates are saying that the, the loss of their regular advocacy activities is um, increasing their cognitive disabilities. So sadly, we've also seen ageism and discrimination towards people with dementia at its worst. There's a lack of transparency of data regarding deaths in aged care facilities, um, aged care facilities denying family visiting rights, which has increased 
significantly the concerns about physical and chemical restraint and you know fear of not being with a family members when they're in the last stages of their life um, and just a you know a general lack of transparency about the withholding of medical treatment uh, particularly in hospitals from older persons generally but also people with dementia and other disabilities and a friend and advocate from Australia said to me today I'm not afraid of COVID-19 but I am now very afraid of going into hospital um, and I think that's a great fear for not just people with dementia but everyone globally um, so it's terrific to be here to help Paula open uh, today's webinar and just a reminder in our slide that um, DAIs uh, set up a lot of extra support groups for people with dementia around the world and uh, social um, just chat groups uh, as well as our cafes and educational webinars. Um, so I'll hand it back to you Paula. Thank you so much Kate. It's great to have Dementia Alliance International with us today. And uh, if anyone with dementia is on the line, please consider joining Kate's wonderful support groups at this time. Now, can I remind all of you, please not to raise your hands. We have hundreds and hundreds of people on this webinar. We will not be able to listen to raise hands, but if you have a question, please do uh, type it in the chat box and we will try and pick up the questions that have most likes uh, at the end of the speaker session. Now, briefly, Annie, please, previous slides. I have to make an appeal to you. During this COVID emergency period, we are a charity, and as many, many other charities, we are struggling to um, change very rapidly in a changing environment. And as, as many of our members are experiencing difficulties with our donors and with our programs. Therefore, this webinar is free as all of the things that we do. However, if you have the capacity, please go to our website. You can see the address below www.alz.co.uk slash donate and make a little, big, medium donation. Any donation will make a difference. Thank you so much. Annie, please, let's start with the panel in hand. Yes, the speakers for today, you can see we have speakers from Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, the Middle East, and the next slide, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and we will have a specific carers perspective. And the next slide, please. So can I start by welcoming uh, Professor Wally Wang of the University of Beijing, uh, and also the Executive Vice President of Alzheimer's Disease Chinese, Wally is the person that started all of our movement around COVID by publishing a fantastic presentation, which is on our website, um, which has inspired many about caring for people with dementia um, and for the families during COVID-19 outbreak in Beijing. Wally, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. And also it's a great opportunity for me to be here. Uh, to share some of work we have done during this period. Next slide. Yeah, go to the next slide. Yeah, um, actually in the past three months, uh, we, our ADC members have done a lot of work in China. So uh, just based on our uh, pilot survey among the ADC members, I'd like to share how we supported uh, persons living with dementia and carers. Actually among the members, we can find that most of the work we have done was to provide online consultation. And also uh, we, we keep on working in our outpatient clinic that we can provide support for people living with dementia. So memory clinic uh, is always um, ongoing. Um, these are two types of work that we, we, um, we always do. And another uh, major task we have done was we provided education on WeChat. Uh, we have uh, in different groups have set up different WeChat account. And then the, a lot of uh, educational materials were delivered on the WeChat. So um, actually here I listed the, mo uh, the major topics of public education. Um, most of the public education were uh, focused on safety management of people living with dementia and also the, uh, the education disseminated knowledge of uh, the, the basic knowledge of COVID-19. 
and also um, daily, daily living care and support and the management of behavior and the psychological symptoms of dementia are the two key topics related to dementia care. And in also we have re received a lot of um, consultation regarding medication. So how we can um, help the people who can stick on their medications during this challenging times is also one of the uh, educational purpose. And of course, all the uh, education uh, folks um, provided the care support and also helped to care to manage their own stress and worries. Next slide. And we have summarized the major questions that we have um, provided consultation during these challenging times. We set up, I classified them into three types of service. One is online consultation, the other is memory clinics, and also the other one is community support. Regarding the online consultation, four, quest, four types of questions were listed on the top, uh, including management of comorbidity of dementia and the physical conditions. This is mostly asked. And the second question is how we can manage the mood problems that people living with dementia had uh, presented. And also, um, during this period, a lot of family members um, get access to consult online consultation and ask how they can get access to medication. Because we have implemented strict quarantine uh, regulations in, in different cities. So um, they, they might feel difficulty to get access to to the clinic, so we provide the consultation how they can get access to medications. Uh, but the, um, the, there is another shortage of online consultation because we could not help the people to, we cannot do physical examination for the people living with dementia. So sometimes the online consultation may not provide comprehensive support for the people living with dementia. And when the people visited memory clinics, four types of questions were raised. One is behavior problems due to interruption of medication and follow-up visits. The other one is behavior problems due to environmental restrictions. And the third is comorbidity of dementia and the physical conditions. So we can see that comorbidity is one of the uh, common questions we have to um, answer. And also we have to find the solutions. And the, the last one is how we can provide clinical diagnosis if we could not um, get access to comprehensive cognitive assessment and also the imaging examination. So this is um, limited by um, the in access to the services. And during the community support, um, there were several uh, questions, including person living with dementia might be lack of uh, personal per, per protection equipment. No, the community have had to to their home to do home visits to provide support, for example, to distribute vegetables to the family. And the, the family has difficulty in refill prescription. And they also have various anxiety and complaints about those difficulties. But also for people living with dementia, they might have only limited channels to, uh, to know the disease. So they have limited information about the disease. That's why the family and the person living with dementia are lack of understanding about how the COVID-19 is going on. Next one. Wally, can I ask you to um, speed up to this slide? Yeah, because the last slide. Yeah, thank you. And uh, one major issue is regarding the care homes. Um, for, actually, we support the care homes mostly um, through the online consultation. And the most challenging uh, issue is how we can manage the behavior and the mood problems for the persons living with dementia, and also the staff has uh, burnout experiences. So um, all this support we provided case by case, 
and uh, in, in addition to the public lectures. So that's what we have done. And also I read um, there are some questions later we can uh, discuss about uh, the common questions, how we can uh, support them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wally. Next slide, please, Annie. Thank you very much. I will not um, stop on this. I will just hold and give the uh, word now to the Chair of Alzheimer Indonesia Netherlands Foundation and the Social Communication Coordinator for Alzheimer Indonesia, ALZI, and that is lovely Amalia Fonk Utomo. Amalia, to you, please. Unmute yourself. Hi. Can I remind everybody, please, not to raise your hands. We are just taking the Q&As. Thank you. Thank you, Amalia. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, ADI. Um, on behalf of uh, my colleague in Indonesia and also Indonesia in the Netherlands. So um, from Indonesia, uh, we will look that we have a lot of community actions because we are really a community countries. So of course, when the COVID-19 outbreak in Indonesia, Alzheimer Indonesia make a simple infographics in a web website for the basic hygiene, like uh, wash your hand and self quarantine and tips and tricks how the elderly and people with dementia staying at home. But of course, um, when uh, after that, that is um, one way uh, communications. This is a passive communications. And then we talk about um, how we want to do more active and community engagement uh, for the people outside in the public. So uh, if you can see here, uh, we have an offline and online mix. Um, we have a crowdfunding with the benihbaik.com to gain a funders and then uh, deliver a face mask for elderly across Indonesia. And then we also have a face mask uh, actions from the east of Indonesia. As you know, Indonesia is really big and we have a lot of islands, so our demographics is a bit challenging for us to reach. And in Jakarta, we also managed to make a half page of an article um, how um, the elderly stay at home active and happy during the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, 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 to make a public awareness about the situations for elderly. And coming from Indonesia, we also have some initiative in Indonesia and abroad, uh, offline, uh, helping the elderly in the neighborhood. That's an intergenerations uh, activity, because we are including the students who are studying abroad, uh, Indonesian students who studied abroad, to help the elderly, such as um, buying the groceries, walking the dogs, or they need to go to the clinics and something like that. And also, we have also global crowdfunding from the Netherlands and Indonesia to help elderly homes in Indonesia with vitamins and uh, medicines and uh, face masks. Because now, face masks is becoming um, um, yeah? is becoming uh, a must. Uh, we have to wear a, a, a face mask in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Yeah. And then, uh, as you see, um, our caregivers meeting, whose we are doing it really regularly, uh, the last uh, caregiver meeting is a session uh, 79. Uh, we are moving to online already. And because the name is a little bit confusing, then we are translate to seminar online, online seminars. So now we are moving to more active, um, so we included people, not one-way communication, but also interactive with our community, which is caregivers, uh, volunteers, people with dementia, and also public. And then we have uh, doing it uh, with Zoom uh, activity. And then also we are exploring, um, that's including more public, and then coming into more private, uh, we have the virtual care navigator sessions. So people who are afraid to go to the hospital, like Kate, Kate said just before, that I'm not afraid of COVID, but I'm, not, but I'm afraid to go to the hospital. So we are um, um, uh, encourage them to contact us and then also register. And then the session is really private with Alzheimer Indonesia, caregivers, doctors, people with dementia. It's a really private session. And they, give, they, they, they have their consultations there. And also we are moving more the intergenerations, doing Instagram live for the informations and also more active on the reductions. Next, please. 
Zumba session? Amalia, can I ask you to rush through these slides? I'm yes. so sorry, but we are running out yes. of time. Thank and then you. also we have an online session for this. Um, this is online sessions, including people with dementia, volunteers. And then we have this education, risk reductions, meaningful engagement. Like you can just read here, we have a list of activity because we believe that small actions, anything is really important to our community. Next, please. Actually, we have a video. Hopefully, you can play it. This is our sessions in the online via Zoom, music and everything. Thank you very much. Can you play it, uh, Annie? Hopefully. Oh, okay. Maybe the music, uh, the, the sound is not there, but that's uh, our music um, uh, sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amalia. There's always some music in Indonesian presentation, which is really lovely and exercise. Annie, please, next one. Um, can I introduce you to the last speakers of our Asian session? And that is Li Yutang, the Secretary General of the One Alzheimer's Disease Association, TADA, who is also a member of the World Dementia Council, as indeed is Wali Wang, and also a board member of Taiwan Family Caregivers Association. Li Yu, please. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to share the experience in Taiwan. Next slide, please. Next, please. Okay, uh, what we have done to support people with dementia and caregiver in Taiwan during this uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, the first thing we developed guideline for uh, uh, the professionals uh, because we think that uh, the professional need to understand the needs of people with dementia and know how to support people with dementia in Taiwan. Uh, we developed this guideline then uh, we share it through uh, social media and we give it to the media and ask them to uh, 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 spread it. And also we share with a Ministry of Health and Welfare and also ADI. And Health Promotion Administration of Ministry of Health and Welfare forwarded the guidelines to all the Department of Health of all local governments in Taiwan. This is very helpful. The second thing is we produce three videos of interactive exercise. And this exercise help people with dementia who stay in the in their house uh, to have some uh, good activity to do in their house. Uh, we share this uh, exercise uh, video uh, with uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare and also ADI and the, the uh, social medias. And the family caregiver response to us this uh, video are very helpful. And Health Promotion Administration of Ministry of Health and Welfare also share these videos on their official website and more people can benefit from this. Next, please. Next, next slide, please. Okay. Then uh, we uh, raise awareness to the uh, public uh, we uh, hope that the people in the community understand what people with dementia needs uh, in the epidemic uh, prevention. So uh, uh, people in the community can help to support people with dementia. And the uh, fourth thing is we share the official infection prevention measures with uh, people with dementia and family caregiver and hope that they can get the right information. And then uh, we ask all the caregivers uh, how they support and help people with dementia to wear the facial mask because uh, most of the people with dementia don't want to wear the facial mask. And uh, the caregivers share their uh, strategies and we connect them and share with more people uh, in Taiwan. So everybody know how to help people with dementia to wear the mask. Uh, the next, uh, we organize online meeting with people with dementia and also uh, online meet, meeting with uh, carers. And so our, uh, the dementia advisory group uh, keep running. And uh, we also have the online speeches uh, for carers and share the care tips. And uh, we collect uh, those TB programs, which uh, people with dementia like and then uh, we share the information with uh, more people with dementia and the family caregiver. Okay, the last, the next, 
uh, slides, please. The last thing I think is very important because during this uh, epidemic, uh, there are so many prevention uh, measures and regulations. And for people with dementia, uh, they are so difficult to understand and follow all the measures and regulations. So it's very easy for them to, uh, uh, to violate the regulation and get a penalty. So we want to protect them uh, from this uh, uh, penalty. Uh, so we advocate uh, for this and uh, I send the press uh, release to the media and also contact with Ministry of Health and Welfare. And finally, we got a very uh, good uh, result. And now people with dementia will not be penalized when they violate the measures or regulation. And if they can show the certification of disability or certification of diagnosis, and this is very helpful. Next, um, I, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Li Yu, thank you so much. You've also answered one of the questions that were coming in uh, about how to deal with um, uh, people with dementia not wanting to wear a mask, but you've also uh, demonstrated how advocacy at governmental level is still very, very important at this point in time um, to make sure that uh, governments understand that not everybody um, can be uh, looking at these measures in the same way. Thank you, Li Yu. Um, now, you. very quickly, I will pass through Mario Possanti, who is the General Secretary of the Federazione Alzheimer Italia, Italy, which is also my country. He's one of the countries that has been most hit. Mario, we are delighted to have you with us. Uh, please, I give, you, I give you the word. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, yes, Italy was the first country uh, eaten hard by COVID apart from Asia, after Asia. We were totally unprepared. As you can see, there are some numbers in Italy. On the right side, you can find some data in, in, in English. Um, so uh, as you can see, the northern region, the blue, are the most uh, um, where the COVID infection is more pervasive. And uh, fortunately, right now, the numbers are uh, not growing anymore. And we can see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. But the situation is still very, uh, very tough. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what we have done, what we are doing. Uh, one of our, of our primary objective was uh, uh, as association is to act as a, an information collector uh, for people with dementia to caregivers uh, in order to let them access to uh, the proper service of the proper information they are looking for. Uh, of course, our helpline did not stop and is continuing to give some answer to the, to the people that contact us. Obviously, it, it operates uh, remotely so there was a need for us uh, for a technological upgrade, which was uh, uh, an interesting things, an interesting uh, thing that happened uh, uh, due to uh, this problem. Um, Sometimes, of course, uh, our help uh, helpline is very important because just a phone call can guarantee the person with dementia and the caregiver the opportunity to receive uh, uh, comfort and support um, um, that the, the, their inability to access service uh, uh, has denied them. Uh, of course, we uh, also produce a, a series of helpful uh, tips uh, that we um, send to our contacts uh, that has been shared through our national um, newspaper online uh, a lot, of, of course. Uh, and we gave some ideas to spend the, the, this time of uh, uh, lockdown in Italy. As you may know, uh, Italy is uh, in lockdown for almost two months uh, right now, so a, a lot of time. Um, of course, uh, many associations, many dementia-friendly communities has, have implemented the new services uh, online, like gym classes, uh, online meeting for different, different professionals, and also offline, like uh, delivery food, groceries, uh, medicine, and so on. So um, thanks to the volunteers that help us in, in, in that way. Um, in, they made this, this uh, on voluntary level just to, to meet the new needs of the people with dementia uh, right now. Um, and lastly, there's a, a great concern in Italy about what's happening and what has already happened in, resi in residential care facility. Um, probably the, the, the necessary protection for people with dementia has not been guaranteed. Uh, the rate mortality is very high and probably mistaken are, are, are being made. So we wrote to our health minister and we wrote uh, 
uh, to the uh, local minister uh, on regional level uh, to understand the situation and uh, to uh, be sure to punish uh, everyone is responsible if if there is someone responsible for that for for the this rate the high rate of uh, of mortality so our advocacy uh, uh, is very it needs more uh, more uh, to be more tough right now because we need to tackle a political level to make sure that everything that happened will, will not happen anymore next slide please so just a, a little things we noticed that the dementia friendly community uh, in this time of uh, um, of lockdown um, did more than other community you know they invented the initiative to support people with dementia and reactivated uh, services earlier uh, we think this is because th there there are uh, a different mentality uh, a mentality that tries to help people with dementia not only on a medical point of view on a medical perspective but also on a social and on a friendly perspective in, in some kind of way so uh, on the right uh, on the right side of this uh, slide you can see uh, the phase two what we, is being called in italy phase two uh the the lift of the of the lockdown of course uh, uh, we will be uh, new something better on the on friday i think but probably the lockdown will be um, lift off uh, on, on the 4th of may uh, on a different uh, um on a different uh, uh, times based on the number of cases of which region and, and based of activities that the people uh, is going to 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 start again of course uh, older people will be the last one to to be able to move freely um, and there will be uh, there will be obliged to to use a facial mask and of course less travel um, I, I think the, the the next thing that we are going to do that we are going to do we will we will write a paper letter to all our contacts uh, because a lot of them cannot use internet or you know there's a lot of social divide so we will write write a paper letter to our content with suggestion on the next phase on the next steps to 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 take on thank you thank you so much mario so interesting a um, lot of questions we have online of people asking whether anyone has got creative tips about how to uh, work on the mask issue um, in the care of people with dementia. So can I ask the, the, the speakers coming, if they can address that in any creative way, that would be lovely. But Mario, thank you so much. Can I ask you for the next slide? Thank you. Can I introduce you to Jesus Mar Rodrigo, who is the CEO of the Confederación Española de Familiares de Enfermos de Alzheimer, CEAFA. Um, Jesus, uh, in the case of Spain, of course, as we all know, you've been particularly hit um, on the issue of care homes. We really look forward to hearing what you have to say to all of us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you uh, to you, Paula, and uh, all ADA team, uh, and, and thanks uh, to the audience to, to be here. Um, yes, Spain uh, perhaps is uh, one of the most uh, hit the country uh, of, uh, by the COVID-19. Um, Yesterday, I, I wrote a publication uh, talking about the 0.43% of the uh, whole population is affected by, by the disease. Uh, since five uh, weeks ago, all centers uh, of support for people with, with dementia are closed uh, because uh, everybody are at home, uh, as in the rest of the world, I think. Um, Inside the Spanish Confederation of Alzheimer's, there are more than 300 uh, local associations working with people with dementia and almost the professionals uh, working in these associations are in unemployment uh, situation. So, um, on a voluntary basis, uh, these people are working in the distance with the people with dementia, uh, make, uh, uh, making a, a guidance and an assessment and so on uh, by phone, by Skype, uh, using a uh, WhatsApp and, and so on, and uh, developing a lot of uh, material support, uh, which, which is uh, sharing uh, through uh, websites. And on the cases, uh, the people have not the possibility to, to access to the communication uh, uh, technologies. Uh, there are, in some cases, uh, uh, the, the collaboration of, of uh, the police, the 
fireman and so on to take those materials to the to home and uh, well uh, it's very interesting the use of uh, social networks uh, to to share uh, guidance uh, information materials for 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 these people and uh, the TV programs uh, are a, a tool uh, will, which is uh, very, very, very interesting, almost in uh, local local TV uh, stations. Uh, one of the most important things we are doing at, 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 at this moment is trying to uh, be ready for the future. So when the, we can go to, to normality, what's going to happen? Uh, now, uh, people uh, affected by uh, uh, with, uh, with dementia are at home. And um, all we know that this, uh, the, the, the condition is worsening. And uh, the carrier uh, living uh, with, obviously with the, the related, uh, is experiencing uh, 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 health problems which uh, um, will become uh, in a new uh, de 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 dementia incident. So uh, we are trying to uh, pre uh, get ready for this new situation. At a political level, uh, we have a, a problem because uh, all uh, social services in Spain are more or less stopped. Uh, all the concern is at the health side, side and um, uh, 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 job and employment and how this COVID-19 is affected to the global economy. So uh, dementia is not a priority in Spain at, at this moment and uh, perhaps the, 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 new, the, the, the next future is going to be worse uh, than the, 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 at the present moment. And uh, the uh, social resources uh, are to be uh, enough to attend uh, the, 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 the new profile of, of, of people affected by Alzheimer's disease. And as I told you before, this is the, our aim uh, which are, are working now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus. You raised such important issue, you know, the fact that there are no social services, the po big political issue about dementia being deprioritized. What is going to happen in the future to our constituency, which of course we have been talking about in a number of the ADI past webinars, and we will continue to talk because we need to be prepared for whenever we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Can I now ask our last speaker from the European segment, Tim Binland, please to come on board. He's the head of knowledge of the Alzheimer Society UK. Uh, and um, he's also an executive member of the faculty of old age psychiatry at the Royal College of Psychiatry. Uh, Tim, please unmute yourself. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, yes, so as Paula says, I'm the head of knowledge at Alzheimer's Society. I'm gonna say a little bit about the UK situation Attendees uh, north of the border will know that uh, Alzheimer's Scotland is their national charity. Uh, the next slide, please, um, just tries to summarise where we are in the UK, which is a little bit earlier on than uh, certainly Spain and Italy. So we've been in lockdown for a month tomorrow, and for us that's meant uh, not going out unless it's for exercise, essential shopping or care. Um, and you can see from the graph that by and large, the social distancing as elsewhere has worked. And so we're now seeing, with the graph showing number of people in hospital in England, we are now seeing that number coming down. And fortunately, we're seeing the daily numbers of people that we're losing to COVID is decreasing. Um, so the positives, I guess, there are we have had good compliance with social distancing. We've had good supply of ICU capacity and ventilators. Um, but on the negative side, and these are themes I'm sure that other countries have seen as well, we have had enormous problems with the PPE supply chain through to hospitals and particular care homes, issues of inconsistent testing in care homes in particular, 
social care, we pushed the government really hard on this, but we, we have only had a social care action plan for one week now to address some of the issues in, in care homes and domiciliary care. Um, a lot of the national guidance is, gener is generic and doesn't apply to people with dementia. And we're really intrigued to see what happens as other countries uh, go into their exit strategies because uh, we can learn from them because at the moment we don't really have a clear exit strategy for this. Um, so next slide, what does that mean for people uh, living with dementia? So we've, we've got multiple ways to gather this. We have a Dementia Voice programme, the Three Nations Dementia Working Group is something we listen to an awful lot, uh, and through our helpline on the phone. So I'm sure, I won't read this out, but I'm sure these issues are ones which lots of uh, attendees will recognise uh, as relevant to their countries. Um, I think some of these are generic, so shopping is a problem um, exacerbated by um, dementia, but probably not um, unique to people with dementia. But equally, um, some of these issues, uh, for example, if, if the person is becoming more agitated and needs to walk, that obviously is a specific issue for some with dementia, it's particular to them. Um, I think the other thing about these issues is that they've evolved over time. So initially, um, we had questions about shopping and isolation, and now increasingly, as the pandemic's really hit us, we issued questions about medical care and care homes. Um, but I think that the context um, of those varies, but I think the fundamental principles of how we think about dementia and uh, work with people with dementia are the same. And my final slide, please, is just a summary of how we're adapting our service response. So this doesn't cover the work we're doing on campaigning, and influencing. But Alzheimer's Society um, service offer is called Dementia Connect and if you look at this left to right the three elements in boxes are things which have actually uh, we've seen differences but they were set up before the pandemic and essentially are able um, to run because they're not reliant on face-to-face -face support. So our website on the far left um, We've got an awful lot of content now for people affected by dementia, tips about activities, frequently asked questions, and increasingly blogs we're posting from people with dementia about how they're faring at home, sharing their experience, supporting others. Um, our phone supports, 80% um, of calls to our phone line at the moment are about coronavirus. And then the third box there are online community talking point um, at times we've seen a six-fold increase in traffic here of people posting, sharing uh, thoughts with others. A quarter of traffic there is always from overseas outside the UK, so it'll be interesting to see when we look at the stats. And then on the right, um, some of our face-to-face -face and group services, which as others we've had to discontinue, we have reinvented those in new ways. So for example, uh, one of our group services, Singing for the Brain, I think somebody mentioned music earlier, hugely popular. Um, we've been delivering that online using Zoom. Um, for those that don't have uh, Zoom, we've got a thing called Ring and Sing, which is a phone-based equivalent. And we've also got a Facebook Live national event on the 30th of April, three till four, which is a global Singing for the Brain. And the other calls I mentioned there, we've replaced our face-to-face -face home visits with welfare calls to check in with people's safety and well-being and companion calls to reduce social isolation. I mean, final thought for me is we are using this way we've adapted our services to, when we come out of this, to think about reconfiguring how we deliver services. So a bit like GPs doing more video consultations, um, are there things we're learning here which will influence our future service offer uh, to make us reach more people in better ways? I'm sure there are, there are, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and so many lovely ideas and such a practical presentation of all these wonderful initiatives that you're doing, but crucially, an inspiration for others, how you are re-engineering uh, practically the uh, work of Alzheimer's Society, much as we have done at Alzheimer's Disease International, in order to be able to cope with the present, but also trying to strengthen yourself for the future, because it's going to be a different world we come out with of. Now, I have two practical issues for the listeners. Please do vote for the questions that you would like to uh, be answered because we are not gonna be able to answer all. We are running a little bit late. 
please do not raise hands during the conversation. We will not be able to um, tend to your raise the hands. We are going to address questions in the Q&A. And uh, to the speakers, please, let's try to keep to your allotted time because we are running a little bit late and we would like to give the opportunity for interactive discussion at the end. And with that, I um, uh, introduce you to Beth Kalmia, who is the Vice President of Care Support of the Alzheimer's Association in the US. Beth, it's a delight to have you with us. Please let us know what's happening in the US. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the Alzheimer's Association in the US has approached this crisis um, in three different areas, really, looking at uh, how we can support long-term care, looking at how we can work with our governmental agencies, and also, of course, looking at how we can support people living with dementia and their family caregivers. Next slide, please. So for long-term care communities, uh, one of the first uh, initiatives that we put together was uh, creating emergency guidance for long-term care. Um, so to help them provide care, and really the, the audience here is is perhaps non-clinical people or people that aren't normally providing care, what is it that they need to know about dementia so that they can uh, appropriately provide care? Because we know that in many long-term care communities, there could be staffing shortages when the staff are impacted by COVID as well. So we wanted to make sure that uh, they had the opportunity to learn about uh, quality dementia care and the strategies they could use when they're providing care for those individuals. We worked with uh, over 36 different large long-term care organizations and trade organizations, and we've been uh, putting that out through all of their channels and have gotten good, good reception from that. Next slide, please. We've also partnered with state agencies uh, to relieve the difficult symptoms of social isolation for individuals living with dementia in residential communities. We know that uh, family members uh, are unable to go in and visit, and uh, this has created a lot of social isolation. So we worked with a um, technology company uh, who has an engagement app, and we were able to partner with uh, the state of Florida, and now we have uh, uh, iPads and this engagement app in over 150 communities in the state of Florida to help families stay connected to individuals living in those communities with dementia. And we're using this model uh, with other states and in, our, in several conversations uh, to hopefully uh, impact that social isolation. Next slide, please. So we also worked with the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, which in the US is, is the one that provides guidance on public health. Uh, and we worked with them to update their guidance for hospital and emergency departments to make sure uh, that there's allowances for care partners. This is really critical. We're hearing really uh, scary stories of people with dementia that are in the uh, in the hospital without anyone to advocate for them. And so we got an allowance so that a family caregiver or a care partner could be there with them so that they could continue to advocate for them if they have to go to the hospital. Next slide, please. For family caregivers, much like uh, many of the other speakers have, have discussed, we have provided guidance around the things they need to know that are different uh, when you're working with somebody living with dementia, you know, making sure that they're uh, implementing the hygiene practices, talking about um, how you can engage people at home, how are you managing uh, behaviors, how are you communicating, um, all of those important things, of course, um, are available uh, on the website at, at our uh, association. And next slide, please. And like many others, uh, it's great to hear that uh, uh, many people have been offering online learnings. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association in the US has been able to transition um, all of our support groups and uh, education programs to online opportunities. Uh, and this has, this has been very meaningful for people and we're um, not unlike Tim, I think we're seeing that when we come out of this, um, online is an option for people that, especially for family caregivers that find it difficult to leave the home. So I think we're going to see more of this as we go on. Of course, we want to be able to get back together again. 
uh, in person, but that these online opportunities are a way to engage more people uh, in a way that makes sense for them. And then finally, of course, uh, like other organizations uh, across the country, we have a 24-7 helpline where we can provide that person-centered care from master's level counselors and social workers to really help families that are struggling with what to do around, do I, uh, what to do around home health care, how do you connect with people in residential communities, and how do you engage people living with Alzheimer's in the home or living with dementia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. So many wonderful um, initiatives from uh, Alzheimer Association in the US. You're having a really tough time. Uh, very interesting to see that you've managed to transition all of the in-person support groups. There are some questions coming in the inbox around uh, carers, uh, how to make sure that carers feel they can connect via Zoom. Some people are experiencing clearly difficulty. Next slide, Danny, please, so I can introduce you. Uh, our Middle Eastern segment, the first person to speak for the Middle East will be Georges Karam, who is the president of the Alzheimer Association Lebanon and who is a geriatric psychiatrist, as well as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Clinical Psychology at the St. George Hospital University Medical Center at Balamand University in Beirut. Um, Georges, please, can you um, let us have your view? You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, like everyone else, you know, we've been really hit hard uh, with the COVID in Lebanon. Uh, the situation is under control compared to European countries, but we had to stop all of our physical activities, and that has been uh, a big problem, uh, like for everyone. So we really had to stop our daycare center. We had to stop our weekly support group meetings that were face-to-face. -face. We used to do monthly awareness lectures and outreach programs and all of that had to be stopped. Now uh, we started transitioning and moving online like other countries have uh, done and uh, in fact that has been a good learning experience uh, for us if you can just have the next slide. It has been a good learning experience for us because uh, we, uh, we were already on uh, social media, but we started using those tools much more uh, heavily and sharing tips and sharing short videos that we are recording. Approximately uh, two or three times a week, we're having short videos with tips for caregivers. And also we started uh, weekly webinars. And it started in fact as an initiative by myself because I was feeling bored at home. But then when I saw that the response was so big, we decided to do it on a weekly basis. And now uh, we've done already more than uh, 10 webinars. Uh, it was supposed to be once a week, but now it's becoming twice a week. And every time was a different topic and it's open to the public. And that has taught us that uh, we are able to reach a wider audience that uh, we did not reach before. So this is through uh, Facebook Live or through the Instagram uh, video page of, of the association. So we were used to having, let's say, 100 people attend our face-to-face -face, uh, uh, lectures, and now we have 500, 600 people, and all of those are recorded, uh, so they stay and people can watch them later on. And that has been a big opening, uh, eye-opening experience for us. Now, we also decided that we really need to restart our weekly support uh, group meetings via Zoom, and our first meeting is going to happen tomorrow. We did not start that yet. We're starting that tomorrow. Uh, and the reason why we did not start it yet is because we thought that the confinement was going to finish and then the government every two weeks is postponing it by two weeks. And as of today, now it seems until May, we're going to be closed again until May 15. So we cannot wait anymore and we'll be starting that uh, tomorrow. The hotline has been very active. A lot of people are calling us and the major issues that caregivers are having is how to deal with uh, elderly people that are confined at home, uh, getting agitated get, because they're not able to get out anymore and not understanding why loved ones are not coming and visiting them, why they have to wear a mask and things like that. And th these have been the most common uh, questions that we are having and we are addressing all those uh, uh, questions. And so we're continuing on uh, doing that and we hope that you know, this learning experience of online, just like my colleague from the US said, we're going to be moving more and more our activities online and to continue forward. Thank, thank you. 
Thank you so much, George. Thank you for your perspective. Farine, um, Farina will be our next speaker. Um, she is with the Iran Dementia and Alzheimer's Association. Uh, Farane is also a board member of Alzheimer's Disease International. Farane, please, if you would like to come in, unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, can I have next uh, slide, please? Thank you for the invitation, Paula, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, t tell you about our experience of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Now, ADI normally, AIDA normally runs a, a clinic day center support group helpline prevention scheme and uh, training center. All had to be stopped uh, at the outbreak and we only had one or two staff going in uh, whenever it was necessary. As from March 15th, the most activities went online to help carers to share with their loved ones uh, uh, and so um, they would have an easier life. Uh, we've been running a WhatsApp group for 60 clients uh, of the day center. Uh, we post uh, voice and text messages, sometimes videos, on cognitive stimulation, physical training, occupational therapy for the three stages of the uh, disease. Also, there is one hour of Q&A each day. Can I have the next slide, please? Now each client has been called regularly to see how they are doing, whether the families need any help or uh, we can do any, you know, we can help them. Uh, the helpline has been extended because we need, the people needed more help uh, on the phone. And uh, so, uh, and also during the lockdown, we had two doctors available to go for home visits. We had this course of mind relaxation and diaphragmatic respiration uh, to, uh, to support carers managing their stress and sleep, and that's proved to be very uh, successful. Next slide, please. Now, we raised the awareness about COVID-19, translating into Farsi ADI W2 messages, producing videos and, on the topics, and posting them on our IDA's website, Instagram, and Telegram channel. At present, the lockdown has been partially lifted and uh, IDAA is uh, running its clinic and office for three times a week uh, with a reduced number of staff, uh, rest of them work from home. Uh, the day center seems to be not be in function for another uh, couple of months, I think. Uh, and with, uh, that's why we are hoping to uh, uh, form more WhatsApp groups uh, to support more carers at home and also have uh, the M MRDR course again on, online and the training center sessions, we are planning to take it online as well. Next slide, please. So the feedback we've had uh, from the carers, uh, they are very, very happy with what we are doing. They don't, they don't want us to stop this uh, WhatsApp group and also uh, want more of it uh, because it has helped them a lot uh, through this hard time. So we are hoping for better times with less stress. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karami. An excellent presentation from one of the countries that has been worst hit by COVID uh, and earliest hit by COVID. I know you've had a much. terrible time. Thank you. Can I now introduce you to our segment on Africa? The first speaker will be uh, Muriel Razon Andrea Maro. Muriel, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly. Yeah, it's um, okay. Who is the communication officer of Madagascar Alzheimer? Uh, so please, Muriel, uh, tell us what you're doing in Madagascar. Thank you, Paola, and thank you, AGI, for organizing this uh, very useful webinar. Um, for your information, our association has a um, day activity center, and people with dementia and elderly people come um, there uh, at least twice a week. So uh, since we had the lockdown on March 23, we had to stop every activity. So uh, most of our members and their families don't have regular access to internet. So uh, we had to find other ways um, 
to communicate and we wanted it to be the same for everyone. So what we do in our association during this uh, COVID-19 outbreak is to make phone calls to our members every three or four days. So with the, the elderly people and people with dementia family members, we exchange news, how are they, do they need something, uh, maybe we can help. And with the people with dementia, we talk with them uh, just the same way we do when they come to the center. Uh, for example, we talk about uh, subjects they are really interested in. Uh, we sing in the phone a song that they really love. Uh, we also try to, to explain and to remind uh, gently what they should do to keep a good health and keep the coronavirus away from them. Uh, we also uh, ha will have short radio programs to talk about uh, COVID-19 issues and tips for uh, people with dementia. And we hope it will be for a wider public. We just found a radio partner last weekend who is ready to give us a seven minute program twice a week and it will begin next friday so we hope we we could reach many other families having people with dementia uh, our association doesn't have um, a, a, a helpline mm, we call it uh, just myself and Sylvia uh, can be reached in our personal numbers at any time to receive calls in case of emergency or if family members with people with dementia just need to talk if they have uh, uh, they need it or if they have to they want to ask for advices and these lines are standard ones, so it's not free to call, uh, but we think giving reachable numbers uh, uh, at any time can always be helpful for families during this uh, outbreak. Next slide, please. And the great surprise during uh, last week was uh, from our partner, the Ladies Circle Madagascar 5 is a club with uh, many young women and they set up a quick fundraising on their Facebook page. Um, so they uh, bought some essential foods and other products uh, to boost the immune system of um, the elderly and people with dementia. And the gift packages were directly delivered to our members house last week. So apart from the usefulness of the products, uh, the families told us that this action was a real source of joy for the elderly and the people of dementia because they felt loved and were sure that we haven't forgotten them. And here you can see some picture of uh, elderly people, our president who is already 77 years old and one of uh, our members who, is, uh, who has dementia uh, receiving uh, package gifts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muriel, and thank you for reminding us of the most important word, love. Love is at the base of exactly. everything that we do. Thank you so much, so very much. What a lovely example. Now I'm going to call on to Ambika Shiva Shanmungam, who is a volunteer with the Alzheimer's and Dementia Organization in Kenya. Ambika, if you can unmute yourself, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Paula and uh, the ADI for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, I'm here to present the Kenyan perspective or our journey in Kenya so far. Next slide, uh, slide please. Yeah, so uh, to just uh, update on the various things that we have been doing uh, for uh, people living with dementia and their carers, uh, we have uh, conducted two webinars so far. The first one was uh, how to take care of the physical well-being or how to be physically active because we believe it has an impact on how we function yeah, uh, mentally as well. So uh, the, the webinar focused on physical exercises and uh, various uh, techniques and tools that one can be using to ensure that we're doing well emotionally as well. And the second web webinar was uh, on nutrition or 
what 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 is the best diet that uh, for both people in dementia and the caregivers and it has received a lot of uh, uh, you know it has been received well so far so that's on the webinars and uh, we also have a call center where people can call uh, call in and tell us what's happening with them and their loved ones and uh, now that uh, people are getting a lot of uh, time to spend with each other at home uh, they, they get a chance to uh, notice what's going on in their loved ones so we are getting an increased number of calls and uh, asking us about what to do next so we are connecting them to uh, neurologists psychiatrists and psychologists uh, depending on what, what 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 issue they are coming up with and uh, like uh, we, you know physical visits are becoming very difficult uh, we are actually directing them to doctors who can do online therapy so that they're able to you know advise uh, the loved ones and the caregivers on what what needs to be done and uh, also we are getting a lot of calls about people who wander away from home so we help them you know kind of reunite with their families by posting uh, their picture on our social media pages and trying to help them reunite with their families that's one of the things that we are doing to support uh, our members uh, right now and the next slide please so also we've uh, we've submitted a, a petition which is going to be sub to the uh, Kenya National Human Rights Commission. And we have actually uh, listed these things that we feel is important in dementia care. And uh, firstly, uh, we want uh, or we want to increase access to specialized care from home. So uh, that is something that we have requested. And uh, also we are uh, we have requested that there is a subsidy on the diapers because that's something that uh, we find here, the cost of diapers is really high. And also there's interrupted uh, medication supply because of the pandemic situation here. So uh, that's another thing that we have requested. And also how to be uh, protecting uh, our loved ones who wander away from home, how to identify how the government uh, can help us, you know, uh, protect our loved ones. And uh, apart from that, we are also offering online support on Telegram uh, for the carers, and we encourage them to uh, you know, share if they are uh, overwhelmed with, uh, you know, with providing care to the loved ones and how to support them. And uh, yes, so, and the other thing that we are doing is if, if, if one of our members or the caregivers uh, reach out to us and they say they are uh, right now overwhelmed with what they're going through. We, we, we follow with, follow up with them by calling them personally and talking to them and providing reassurance and psychosocial support. Yeah, that's what we have been doing in Kenya so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambika. I love the virtual hugs. I think we all need a virtual hug at the moment. I'm, I'm sure everybody would concur. Thank you. Now we're running a little bit late. Um, I still hope to have time for a Q&A. Please vote for the questions you would like to be answered, but I don't know if we'll have the time. Marta Janko is our next speaker. She's a volunteer, uh, president of the Association de la Lucha contra el Mal de Alzheimer y Alteraciones de Argentina. Marta, it's a pleasure to have, uh, have you with us. Please um, tell us about your experience. Hi, everyone the slide please well uh, we are here in buenos aires argentina alma is a west association we are celebrating our first anniversary uh, we have our website which has been working uh, for some years uh, we have our activities, uh, working groups uh, support groups Prevention groups, and our has stopped now. 
because we are isolated. So, um, online activity has uh, We have opened a special section called Quarantena. In this section, we share of small activities, uh, and in our place, in our association with the group of people. Now we are sending these video activities to their homes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, but we cannot hear you. Your connections, unfortunately, is breaking down really badly. So um, I will suggest that we pick up on the slides later, but we pass to the next spe speaker because it's very hard to hear you in this, um, uh, in this circumstance. Could I please ask uh, Ingrid Wellington to come? Um, on board, please. Ingrid, could you please um, unmute yourself? Ingrid is the president of Dementia Friends uh, of the Dementia Association of Panama. Ingrid, could you please unmute yourself? Hello. 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 Could you hear me? Hello. Yes, Ingrid, we can. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Adi, for the invitation. Okay. Well, we have been adapted to our new life of isolation. So first of all, we are preparing ourselves, volunteers with technological and support in order to continue with our activities to support people living with dementia and their families. So let me try to, sh to share with you some small changes that can make a big difference. Um, most of the countries in Latin America are giving conference, visual offer uh, therapy, also seminars online, using Facebook, radio program. And also we have a plat virtual platform, uh, which is called Remember Me. Uh, was uh, created by Alzheimer Bolivia. And this is a helpful tool for family who has a, a person with dementia. And they can share, they can find there some types of care, like cognitive, um, physical, psycho-emotional, and other things. So next slide. In, next, please. Okay, as Panama is part, no, the previous one. As Panama is part of the Dementia Friends movement, okay, we have decided to invite all Dementia Friends to become, to join with us and try to be in contact with people living with dementia. And considering that this time is so difficult for family, it is important for us that we concentrate in two key messages. The first one, it's possible to live well with dementia. So what can I do to help others live well? So uh, dementia friends call the person and then they can talk, see, listen music. Music is very important, it's valuable tool. Music attach emotions and also memories. So it's very important that dementia friends take that opportunity with them. And also that it very is important it's important that they talk directly to the person. But when I say directly to the person, especially with them, nothing about a difficult situation, about COVID, but the most important thing is the person. Next slide, please. Okay, here, I would like to share with you my experience when I make a video call with a beautiful lady. I call her and then I talk around five minutes, then I asked her if she danced, and then she said, oh, let me dance. And she was dancing with her grandson. And then when we finished the conversation, she went to the sofa, and then the daughter asked, what's happening, mom? And she, she was looking to the ceiling, and she said, is she called tomorrow? So the daughter sent me a text message telling me, Ingrid, you don't have idea how happy is my mother. Thank you so much. So I felt very, very happy. So I, I will continue with all the dementia friends in Panama 
calling them because a person living with dementia is a person. It's not a problem. So I encourage all of you to continue doing your great job. And I would like to take this opportunity to give thanks to all the associations of Latin America because they are doing a very great job. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. And uh, we know now, of course, that our colleagues in Ecuador are having a very difficult time. So our thoughts go specifically to them at this very moment in time. And can I now call for the first speaker of our Caribbean segment, that is uh, the wonderful Ishtar Govaya, who is a researcher of Tribe Jamaica, an editorial board member of Dementia, the International Journal of Research and Practice, um, and a scientific committee member for the Alzheimer's Disease International Conference 2020. Ishtar, um, tell us what's happening in Jamaica. Happy, happy to do that. Thanks, everyone, for all of the wonderful stories and experiences so far. Next slide, please. The Strengthening Responses to Dementia Research Project in seven developing countries and in Jamaica, based within the Caribbean Institute for Health Research, has taken a pause on all fieldwork, all in-person fieldwork, as we try to adhere to ethical requirements and try to reimagine what engaging with participants means during this time of remote work and lockdown. In Jamaica, uh, we are focusing our efforts, continuing to focus our efforts, particularly through our national advisory group members on advocacy at the government level. This advocacy has resulted in different types of interventions happening in the background and then presented in the foreground in the media. There are examples of for, uh, hotlines being established for senior citizens. There are examples as well of more advocacy and action related to protection in the form of financial grants. Next slide, please. We have reimagined and started to pivot and capitalize on our support approaches. We provide free dementia care consultations. We have met virtually with the National Health Fund and are continuing to advocate for dementia medication subsidies. We've engaged in and are continuing to engage in knowledge translation activities where we distill information from press briefings into digestible bites that we disseminate via our, our e-newsletter distribution list. And we work with our stakeholders, such as the National um, Council for Senior Citizens within the Ministry of Labor and Social Security to develop collaborative media campaigns. Next slide, please. We are maintaining our research activities and engagements. This includes making calls to each of our participants to check on them, to find out about their resource needs, and then to develop customized packages of resource needs for them. Whether that is information, whether that is linking with specific services, grocery delivery services, if they mention these things may be needed, or any other type of need that they indicate to us, we link with our additional stakeholders that are on our national advisory group members, such as the Caribbean Community for Retired Persons. We continue to crowdsource information about that would help in terms of understanding and mapping the dementia care landscape in Jamaica. And we distribute a monthly e-newsletter, which has focused largely in the last one on COVID-19. And we are repurposing and tweaking our social media purposes. This pandemic, as Kate had mentioned at the very beginning, Kate Swafford mentioned at the very beginning, is, is in a sense reiterating the need for us to develop um, clear platforms for sustainable functioning. And one of the things that we have been thinking about as a research project is sustainable funding beyond and financial models beyond the grant project. So we continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ista. And um, very great insight from your side as usual. Great eloquence. Um, can I now call, please, uh, a, a carer on their own experience, Florence Mueni, who cares for a person with dementia in Kenya will tell us about her own experience. Florence, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much for inviting me to this forum. I speak as a daughter of a 77-year-old lady with my mother. Um, she's had Alzheimer's. Uh, she was diagnosed about 16 years ago. 
And uh, in this situation that we are in, she is, uh, I would say, in um, the last stages because she does not walk and she does not speak. She's confined to a wheelchair. So um, with the COVID-19 pandemic situation, as a caregiver, I have been going through a lot of uh, stress and anxiety, I can say. Um, I do work, so um, I was supposed to be going to work every day uh, in, in spite of the lockdown uh, because I, I provide uh, some services that are in between essential. So um, because of the anxiety of me being the one that gets to go out of the house and expose myself so much, I, I I went to my boss and I said, I cannot do this anymore. I, I need to be allowed to stay at home so that I, I don't expose my mom. And she agreed to do that. So right now I'm working from home. Uh, my anxiety has gone down a bit because I am able to control my movements. Uh, However, as a caregiver, um, some of the things and services that uh, I used to have my mom get are no longer available because of uh, social distancing. She, she, she's been getting visits from a physiotherapist that has stopped. Um, uh, she, she's, we've been taking her to the hospital for medical checkup. Uh, we have stopped like uh, going to the hospital. Like somebody says, the fear is going to the hospital might uh, expose uh, a person even more. So because she's the most vulnerable person in my house right now, uh, I find myself having to be so conscious of everything I do. Uh, and uh, I do have a living caregiver also. So we are trying our best uh, to, to, to protect her because of not only her age, uh, but because we are not even able to know if she's having, uh, she's having any illness. So we have to look at our temperature. Uh, we have to just make sure that uh, we are protecting her. So there are some precautions that I have taken uh, as a caregiver. Uh, Kenya is not in total lockdown. Uh, but there is this impending uh, uh, anxiety that it can be put in lockdown any time. So I, 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 I have made sure that I have stopped uh, everything that she needs to use on a daily basis, you know, that I have enough diapers, you know, I have bought uh, medication that she uses. She is also hypertensive. So, you know, I have three months supply of everything just to ensure that in case of a lockdown, I don't have to struggle uh, trying to get the things that she needs to get. Uh, I have basically had to limit uh, the number of visitors coming to my house and having to say no to some relatives you cannot come and visit at this time uh, because uh, having more people in the house uh, poses a greater risk. We do have in our country a social, a social protect, protection mechanism where elderly people, wh whether with dementia or not, receive some little uh, money. So that has been helpful. And so even with this conference, I have uh, learned a lot about some of the things that I can continue to keep in place, to put in place. But it's not easy uh, being a caregiver of uh, an Alzheimer uh, patient. Uh, I have to be strong for her. I am strong for her. And I just feel that uh, great sense of responsibility uh, that the, the stuff that I do and the decision that I make at this time are likely to affect her. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Florence, thank you so much for giving us the, the real uh, view from what is happening uh, from your side. That has been greatly insightful and also about all the issues that you've had to grapple with regarding risk management in this particular time. So thank you. Now we are going to open with a few questions. Um, we have received way uh, too many questions to answer them all. Thank you for all of you for participating. 
Um, first of all, can I remind you all, we are recording this webinar, it will be available, you will be sent a link, you will be able to watch it and you will be able to rewatch the slides at your leisure. Also, whenever people have been asking uh, for um, information that has been contained in the slide, we will look for those links and we will make sure that you uh, get those links um, in due course. Uh, now, uh, we've had the two questions that have been the most popular. The first one is, uh, I've been asked the question of whether we have any tips for people with dementia living by themselves and who do not have anyone to support them. Now, can I please ask that Cal Mia from the Alzheimer Association in uh, the States to please come out to that question first. Um, Beth, I know you're still with us, please. Sure, thank you. So um, obviously uh, right now for individuals living with dementia on their own, it is going to be a challenge in, in, in the US of course, and in many of our other uh, countries, there are helplines for you. So if you don't have internet or you're not comfortable using that, to reach out to the helpline and see what kind of uh, services might be available to support you as you're going through this so that you can minimize risk. Um, so my advice would be to reach out to those helplines if possible. Okay, any other of my panelists would like to come into this question, please? Perhaps, Tim? If you do, please unmute yourself. Um, I'm not hearing anyone coming on to that one again. So I would like to ask the second question that has received the most number of answers has been around multilingualism. So there's been a question asking how does a particular nation cope with the fact that people may be speaking different languages in that very nation. Now of all my panelists, I think Ambika uh, living in Kenya lives in the question with the most complex multicultural, uh, multilinguistic setting. So Ambika, would you like to tell us something about the experience of Kenya in this particular area? And you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, so uh, when, whenever we make a newsletter or something of that sort, to, uh, we, we translate that into uh, other languages that are widely spoken in Kenya. So uh, it can be Swahili or, you know, languages that are widely spoken. So that has helped us. And are you receiving a lot of questions in different languages? Uh, no, we are, uh, it's mostly in uh, Swahili or and English. So we are able to communicate with them, yeah. Mostly with those. Thank you so much. Um, can I please uh, remind everybody that we will try and uh, collate your questions and we may be able to give some answers at a later stage or at a later webinar. So do please uh, keep in touch and keep connected. Now, I only have two minutes left for my closing remarks. So I'm going to bring this webinar to a close. So first of all, I would like to thank all of you that logged in. Um, at some point in the webinar, we know that many people could not log in because we had exceeded our uh, maximum number of participants. So thank you very much uh, and sorry for those that have not been able to uh, participate to the live recording, but you will be able to hear me now um, on a website when, uh, wherever you are. Uh, we also would like to remind you that there is going to be another webinar that is going to be open to the public and we will announce it in due course on uh, a different topic. Um, finally, I'd like to remind you, next slide please, Annie, um, uh, that if you have enjoyed this webinar, and in any case, if you would like to support us, we are running a fundraising uh, campaign to help uh, uh, ADI at this very difficult time. Um, of the COVID-19 emergency. So if you can make a donation, please do. And uh, next slide, please, Annie. Ah, I think that's it. Um, uh, and I can also remind you, please, uh, to continue to do all the wonderful things that you do. We have been hearing today to speak about very practical activities. A lot of you have asked about those practical activities. We will make sure the links will be delivered to you. But uh, Muriel from Madagascar mentioned the word love. And I think at the bottom of everything that we do, there is love. 
We are trying to do our best in very difficult circumstances. You're all here motivated by love. So I would like to thank my panelists for working so hard uh, to make our love more evident. I would like to uh, thank all of you online that clearly love someone or love to help others uh, for the wonderful work that you do. So thank you for coming and hearing us. Thank you very much for your support to, for Alzheimer's Disease International for everything that you do. And finally, thank you to my amazing team without which we couldn't have run this webinar uh, with well over 500 participants. So thank you so much, everybody.